I think it's uh, actually great to, to uh, follow up the previous talk. A lot of these uh, concepts really resonate between the two. Uh, as Chandra pointed out, I'm going to speak uh, mainly about yeah, the process of choosing an ELN. Um, and uh, I'll use a sort of uh, high level overview of, of what I'll talk about. So first I wanna uh, point out, uh, you know, what are the differences between ELN and, and LIMS? And uh, as, as uh, just pointed out uh, from, from John that uh, there's hardly a difference between the two, or, or let's say there, there's, there's no clear dividing line between what is a ELN and what is a LIMS. Um, so I'll start with talking about that, then I'll give sort of an overview of the ELN market and then discuss some of the, the factors uh, that one should be or could be choosing uh, when, when trying to decide on a solution. Um, just for reference, uh, here are a few links that are very handy, give some very good uh, information about ELNs. So the first one is um, from the Harvard Medical School and they posted on Zenodo and it's actually, it keeps getting updated with m more information. And that was kind of our starting point uh, for assessing ELNs. Um, they have a good comparison matrix there. Uh, the second link is something from our uh, colleagues at uh, NFDI for Chem, a new initiative that they're working on, sort of an ELN finder. And this is like a web-based application to sort of help you go through the process of, of uh, picking an ELN. I have to point out, it's only a demo right now. It's still in development. Uh, so, but just to let you know, it's, uh, it's there and, and will be getting improved over time. Uh, as well as uh, this uh, very nice overview I came across from, from Lab Folder. So Lab Folder is an ELN vendor, but they gave a pretty um, unbiased uh, overview of electronic lab notebooks. Uh, so follow these links, I would recommend them just for, for reference if you're going into making that decision. Um, so let's see here. So, so section one, uh, what are ELNs and LIMS? So traditionally, like, first of all, why are there the, even these, these two terms, if we're saying like you can't really, there's no fine dividing line. I think traditionally um, there's lab notebooks, like a paper lab notebook, and then just for writing down notes, and then the electronic form of that. And that's kind of the most basic thing of what an ELN should be. Uh, on the other hand, um, LIMS are for like much more complex systems to, to manage all the information going in and out of a, a laboratory. And these are, yeah, pretty much only existed in the digital age. And um, uh, I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about the two, but uh, so an electronic lab notebook, uh, what, what kind of goes in these things? Uh, so as John pointed out, I mean, observations kind of done on the fly. It's basically the author's opportunity to add metadata, um, to give some context to, to what's been going on. If you see this picture uh, on the side here, mm, you see like a lot of times people do sort of on the fly analyses in these as well, uh, and just write down kind of free text, unstructured observations. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the, another important thing about these is that they'll make reference to other entities, such as an experiment. You might, you know, give a few pages in your notebook, some experiment number. And that means within these few pages, I'm dealing with that experiment and the description that I gave as the purpose of the experiment applies to all the pages with the experiment number, whatever on it. Yeah. Uh, likewise, you might make a reference to a sample, or you might make a reference to an instrument uh, or a chemical in your inventory. And these get written down in these uh, notebooks. So with electronic lab notebooks, um, the, we have the opportunity to make it such that these references are not just free text, but they're actually links to more information about those entities. Uh, so that's one of the big, uh, I think, advantages of using an electronic form of a, a lab notebook. Okay, laboratory information management systems, however, um, are, as I pointed out, much more complex things for, for managing all the things that go on in a laboratory. And uh, I think one of the big differences between a LIMS system and an ELN is that LIMS systems kind of only really make sense or initially only made sense uh, 
for processes that were very routine. So if there's like an, an analytics laboratory that uh, receives samples from customers and then has to run some kind of assay, then do a routine analysis and submit the results in a report or something like that. This would be done in, in a laboratory information management system, very structured, uh, very homogeneous, um, albeit quite complex. Yeah, but they would basically, they have modules for things like sample management, uh, workflow management. So for example, um, after sample has been received, then send notification to this person, then pass the sample on through the pipeline, uh, these kind of things. So managing those kinds of workflows, uh, also quality assurance uh, that the that essentially the results that are delivered that they're they're valid and um, accurate. Uh, they also have things for managing inventory, for managing chemicals in stock in the laboratory, um, laboratory execution system. So basically uh, carrying out the uh, measurements. Uh, if they have customers, they need to deal with invoicing. There's reporting. There's managing in, in instrumentation. There's also sample tracking, and and scheduling. So this is really a lot, yeah, for uh, for for a system. And you can see a lot of the things here are much more agnostic than just a laboratory. Yeah, you like many organizations uh, have. Um, information management systems to deal with things like scheduling and, and inventory management and reporting and invoicing and workflow management. Yeah, they're pretty agnostic. The thing about a laboratory information management system is that they package all the ones that are typical of, of a laboratory setting and they name them in a way and build a data schema in a way that is already custom suited to a laboratory. Yeah, and so here's kind of an example of, of what a workflow might look like. Yeah, there's a registration of a sample on a computer. You make a label, you label your materials with these barcodes, you do some preparation. Uh, yeah, you can allocate the work to different instruments, perform the testing, um, maybe retesting, and then essentially uh, reporting on, on what was uh, made and then sent off to the consumers of the data or sent for archival. So you can see, uh, Depending on the laboratory, these workflows can be quite complex, but also quite diverse. Yeah, how a workflow looks for one lab that does, I don't know, routine GC measurements would probably look totally different than a workflow for uh, uh, fib lamella and TEM measurements. Yeah, so um, these tend to be pretty elaborate software. Okay, so um, now, I haven't really explained what's where where those blurred lines are between ELN and LIMS, and I think you'll get the picture of that when I go over the the market and start to show you some examples of some uh, ELN slash LIMS on the market. Uh, so first of all, um, we started we went and assessed uh, I think about around forty ELNs slash LIMS uh, starting from the that Harvard Medical Schools table. Um, and we, we did a sort of detailed assessments of them, compared their features and so on. And one thing that we eventually kind of realized is that there, we could group them into three types of business model. Uh, we, we realized this once we started asking for quotes. Um, so the topmost you see is kind of custom or industry oriented. Um, and these kinds of ELNs, they're quite expensive and really limbs, definitely limbs, more, more limbs oriented. But they, they're typically like uh, the software company will have a bunch of modules and they will custom build uh, your software for you as, as per your requirements. So they'll spend a phase with your, with your laboratory or your organization doing um, uh, requirements analysis and discovery to understand your needs. And then they'll build this custom solution for you. Uh, so these are often built in uh, or, or used in industry. So large organizations that do research would probably invest the money in one of these. They are quite expensive and often out of the budget for, for academic research. Yeah. The second grouping is, uh, I would call it mass oriented, mass user oriented. Uh, and these are all uh, commercial solutions. Uh, they essentially aim at satisfying the largest number of customers with one software. 
They don't have to reconfigure or rebuild anything. Uh, they can just have one code base and just sell that thing. So they really aim to um, satisfy, like understand the common needs and then satisfy those needs. Um, however, they, they do come in different flavors, kind of geared towards different domains. So a lot of them are geared towards bio and pharma, uh, less so towards uh, chemistry and material science or physics. Um, and part of the reason is because those are bigger markets generally. And one of the problems that you face in, in these types of situations is that uh, these products, these ELNs are managed by a product manager. And this, this, these people decide which features and which functionalities to include in their product. So if you have one of these ELNs and you want it to do something that it doesn't do yet, you could put in a feature request and they would decide whether they want to implement it or not. And they would judge that based on whether they think your feature request satisfies the majority of the customers. If this is just for you, they probably won't do it, even if you offer them a good sum of money. Um, if it's for, if it's going to be of interest for a large audience, then they'd be more likely to implement it. So this can be a problem if if you pick an ELN and you want to you want it built further in a particular direction, um, and uh, you can't get a, a vendor to respond. Um, the last grouping is the open source slash free. Uh, I want to distinguish between open source and free. Um, not the same thing. Um, uh, open source does not necessarily mean free. It can be open source and still in order to use it, you, you should be paying license fees. At the same time, um, uh, yeah, some, uh, some open source ones have sort of like a hybrid model where you have the option to pay for it if you want to use additional services or have additional features. So uh, these ones would be, for example, uh, Elab FTW, OpenBiz, and ChemMotion. Um, again, you may not have all the desired features you want. Um, on the plus side, you in principle could develop them yourself if you have the uh, in-house expertise to do so. Okay, so here are some examples of the, the enterprise grade ELN slash LIMS. Yeah, Benchling, LabVantage, Signals from Perkin Elmer, IDBS, and uh, Sapio Sciences pr provides one. Now I can't show you any uh, examples like demos of these because that's one of one of the things you'll recognize that it's a custom slash enterprise grade ELN if they don't offer you a free demo. If they say something like, oh yeah, it'll take us a week to configure it and we have to set up a bunch of meetings first before you can actually see the product. That's a good sign that it's a custom product. Um, the mid-range ones, so the, the ones aimed at uh, the, the mass public, uh, these ones typically you can sign up right away. You can get a free account. Uh, whether they're full featured or not, usually they'll have some limitations on the free accounts. Um, but you can at least get your hands on it and see what it does, what it's like. Uh, there's quite a few of them and they differ substantially in their scope. Um, so some of them do a lot, have a lot of limbs functionality, and some of them are really focused more on being note-taking tools. Um, and it depends really on what you want. So here's, here's where I'll sort of demonstrate. So this is one example from LabStep, it's called, um, where it's not really clear. This is where the lines get blurred between ELN and, and limbs. So the page here is like a, a notes taking place for an experiment. So you can enter in a reaction scheme and you can just write down procedures and so on. And then on the, on the left bar here, you see these little icons. So one is for experiments. Uh, this one's for protocols, I think. This one's for inventory. There's ones for instruments. So you can do a lot more than just write down notes. You can, the, the benefit here is that you can insert like references to particular instruments and particular chemicals. You can say, I used five milligrams of this chemical and I produced that sample, for example. Yeah, so um, yeah, then here's another example. So Lab Guru, very, very similar. Um, note taking right in the middle and then along the side, uh, access to all these other things like instruments and inventory and protocols, uh, things like that. Uh, likewise, eLab Journal, also very similar in functionality, uh, note-taking, uh, management of samples, management of equipment, management of protocols, a concept of experiments. There's also a concept of projects and studies. 
Um, and so it, again, you're doing uh, substantially more than simply writing down notes. Uh, you're making use of that, the thing that I spoke of when I showed the paper notebook that when we're writing notes, we're often referencing other entities somewhere else. And in the digital world, we can actually make those references like hyperlinks or references to some database entity somewhere such that if we follow or trace them, we can find more, find out more information about that thing we're referring to. Um, so it makes them essentially machine actionable. Um, here's another example, SciNote. Um, this one, uh, yeah, I mean, it has inventory, but I would say the inventory is, is uh, uh, not very full featured. Um, and that, that's sort of the difference between a lot of these. The, the um, extent to which they've handled uh, each of these different aspects of, of notes and inventory and uh, protocols and so on differs from one solution to the next. Uh, this one's lab folder. This one is really focused mainly on notes and on the fly analysis. So you see, you can attach electronic, uh, or sorry, you can attach like Excel sheets and documents and PDFs and things like this. So uh, this one kind of doesn't, at least didn't at the time have, um, they're, they're working on it, but doesn't have an inventory management system. So uh, it's basically, you're just entering in free text and pasting in pictures and um, yeah, uh, writing down your observations. Okay, so so that's kind of, I hope you can see the, the similarity between all of those, those different um, uh, mass customer based uh, ELNs, the sort of mid range ones. They're, they're all pretty affordable, to be honest. Um, most organizations should be able to afford uh, subscriptions to these. A lot of them have um, either options of uh, fully cloud hosted and or on premise hosted or uh, multi tenant uh, hosted, like a virtual private cloud and things like that. Um, at a pretty reasonable uh, price that I think most organizations can afford. So um, yeah, that's, uh, it is certainly an option uh, for, for a lot of people to try one of these. Um, the last are the, the open source ELNs. Uh, so ELAB FTW, OpenBiz and RSpace. Uh, I should mention RSpace, it has, so it has an open source version, but it also has a uh, commercial, like a paid version that has additional features and additional functionalities. Um, but you could, in principle, take the open source one, install what it has on your own servers, and uh, if you're so savvy, build on the functionalities yourself. Um, yeah, OpenBiz uh, is, I think, completely open source. Maybe they also offer something, uh, maybe just a hosting solution for you. And then ELAB FTW is completely open source and completely free. And it's up to you to uh, manage it on your own uh, uh, IT infrastructure. Um, yeah, our space. Uh, so here's here's Elab FTW. Uh, I think you'll see some more of this later on today. Um, but uh, very similar. It it the, to the to the uh, commercial ones in that uh, there's uh, oh I should have blanked out the name here. Oops. Um, that there's there's a, a database for like you can do sample management and inventory management to some degree here you can also do instrument scheduling and you can uh, write in your notes um, and it, it handles a lot of those functionalities um, yeah our space uh, this one does not have as far as I know any real uh, inventory management it's really mainly focused on uh, note taking and describing workflows and so on. Um, and yeah, I didn't have one for open biz. Open biz is one that really takes a lot of configuration to get going. Uh, so that may be a bit of a drawback for open biz, but uh, I know some uh, institutions are really doing a lot of impressive stuff using open biz. Um, okay, so with all these options, right? Uh, how, how are you going to make a, a choice uh, for a solution? Well, there's a lot to consider and it kind of depends on who you are and what you need it for. Are you uh, an individual researcher, a research group, a department, uh, an entire university? Um, and what do you want the ELN to do? Yeah. So do you want it just for taking notes? 
Um, do you also want to do some laboratory uh, information management or laboratory management? Um, do you want to use it for your data management? So uh, I think I kind of didn't really show it, but almost all of these ELNs have the functionality that you can attach a file. Um, so for example, if you're doing measurements, your instruments are outputting um, raw data files, you could in principle just attach them to the electronic lab notes. Um, that being said though, uh, do you want your ELN to be acting as your file store for all your raw data? Um, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, also data analysis. Some of them have data analysis functionalities, uh, yet at the same time, a lot of people already have data analysis tools that they're usually working with like MATLAB or Origin or Python or whatever. And they're comfortable using those and don't really want the ELN to do it. So this is another question. Should that be within the scope of your ELN? It depends on what, what you want basically. Um, now, one thing to consider, however, when, when uh, trying to decide what your app should or what your ELN should do, uh, you have to consider that uh, it's one piece into that's going into a larger ecosystem uh, of a whole bunch of digital tools. And so you have to kind of know what is its responsibility and to determine which solution has, has which responsibility. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, so like, are there, for example, in your organization or where you're about to use this ELN, are there already established solutions in place for dealing with some of the things that you want the ELN to do? If so, then special considerations are needed. Um, and I'll give you an example here of where you kind of need a single source of truth. So here is a dedicated chemical inventory application. It's called Chem Inventory. Yeah, um, uh, it was used before an ELN was implemented at this organization. Um, it is very good for chemical inventory but it only does chemical inventory. It's very specialized for that. Yeah, so lab technicians were used to using it and it satisfied pretty much all their needs. Okay, so then an ELN gets implemented and this ELN here also has chemical inventory functionality. Um, it's, it's pretty good, I would say. It covers most of people's needs, but let's say it's not as feature rich as, as, as this one, as far as inventory goes. This one can do more inventory related things, whereas this one does sufficient inventory related things, yet is integrated with an electronic lab notebook. So um, let's say we have two different types of users. One user is a lab technician who actually doesn't do experiments. Uh, and so doesn't really use the electronic lab notebook tool but uses, does mostly chemical inventory and uses this one and loves it and just wants to use that one. And then you have a researcher who doesn't spend a heck of a lot of time needing to manage chemical inventory, but still needs to be a bit aware of it, interact with it to some degree and prefers to work with the electronic lab notebook. Okay, so uh, we have to, we can't necessarily get rid of one of these applications if, if uh, one is already embedded and being used and satisfying, let's say, some of our needs. Um, so essentially, in this case, we have two applications. Each of these applications has their own database on the back end, and each of these databases has a table for your chemical inventory, at least. Yeah, but there's no, I mean, a lot of the time these are referring to the same physical entity. It might be referring to the same bottle of acetone, for example, but they're represented in two different places, uh, maybe with different pieces of metadata. Maybe the fields are named differently or they're spelled differently or they have different uh, IDs. Yeah, so what can end up happening is that uh, these databases can get out of sync. Um, and this this is a very, very common problem in organizations that have uh, lots of different applications, and especially uh, legacy applications that are, con are still in use. Yeah, this is sort of the origin of the, the, the data silo. You have two, two applications that have some kind of overlapping functionality, but not completely overlapping functionality. And then you have two different user bases using them yet the databases that they're storing are supposed to be storing information about the same actual same entities. Yeah, so in this situation, and this is a big tricky one to, to fix, but ideally you would 
not have two separate databases. You would have one database and you would have each of these applications interacting with a common database on the back end. This is not always possible. I mean, it would be possible if you could dig into the code, but since these are uh, vendor, very often vendor uh, provided applications, um, you can't necessarily go in there and modify the way their code works. Um, so uh, yeah, this is something that you, I think have to think long and hard about when, when you're choosing to implement uh, something like an ELN, which does more than just note taking. Uh, that it's it's going to be it's going to be overlapping with other systems that are in place. Um, yeah, so an ELM and LIM system is is typically not the only application people will be using for their research. Um, and yeah, you really need to think about how the ELN will react uh, will interact with other components. Um, Here is an example of OpenBiz. So this is a schematic. That, that this is one research group that had uh, taken OpenBiz and built it into their uh, uh, architecture and presented this, this sort of diagram as to, as to how it works. So you see up here, for example, users, they enter a sample and metadata and that goes into OpenBiz. So presumably they use the OpenBiz uh, web interface to, to enter information and that creates a new entity in this uh, database here that's stored on OpenBiz. Yeah, then there's a, a register of sample and metadata that's also done in OpenBiz. Um, then comes sample in an instrument. The instrument measures the sample, generates some output, and then there'd be some real-time analysis that makes some files, and then it gets synchronized with Dropbox, and then again, pushed to OpenBiz. And then Datafy is also pushed to OpenBiz, and you, then you can use browsing and visualization to look at the data that's in open biz. So to me, I mean, this is doing really a lot more than just being an ELN or LIM system. Uh, this is uh, looks very central um, to what they're doing. And I think if you're starting with a fresh organization where you don't have systems in place already that you have to sort of um, harmonize with, then you can, you can build it however you like. And then maybe it's the least effort to just use the existing uh, data stores that that uh, the ELN system provides. Uh, here's another one very similar. Um, so data data created from this mass spectrometers, I guess, some kind of data processing happening here outside of their uh, ELN, and then pushed to the data stores of OpenBiz. Yeah, so they call it Dropbox, but it's not actually the commercial Dropbox that they all think of. And then there's a bunch of databases inside of here. Uh, protein database in this case, metadata. Um, and then they can use their this year some high throughput computing resources to go and fetch data that's stored inside open business data stores and run some, some processing on it. Uh, so again, in this case, open business is doing a lot more than, than just simply an ELN. It's, it's the data stores, is providing the data stores, is providing all the the databases um, uh, and the APIs, it's really doing a lot. Um, and maybe it, it could make sense uh, in, in some situations. Um, so for example, I would say uh, here, here are some sort of situations that you might be faced with. Um, if you're a single group, small research group, and there's no established processes, then you could probably go for a full featured ELN and that would be enough. You could let it do everything for you. You could let it do your inventory and you can let it do your note taking and your, your file stores and everything. Um, it would be very economical to do so, I would say, um, uh, but not everyone's in that situation. So uh, if you're a large group or an organization and you have no established processes, like the, you're this, the, the first one to be starting this sort of, um, digitization of the research process for your organization, then um, keep in mind that uh, you, you might not be able to satisfy your entire organization's needs with uh, one single ELN. Uh, you might need supplementary applications and you might wanna have 
a sort of more scalable uh, storage data storage system and a more open and accessible data storage system than just always interacting with the API of your ELN. Uh, so in this case, I would say, uh, probably you want to treat an ELN as just one component that plugs into a larger ecosystem. And you would need to plan for that in terms of deciding which application should be treated as your single source of truth for which part, bit of data. And, and think of, of ways uh, how, how you want to uh, manage, let's say, synchronization of your databases. Um, yeah, so, so if possible, design for a single source of truth. So decide like, let's say, okay, our ELN is gonna do our sample management um, and our the chem, chem inventory is gonna do our chemical inventory, right? But, and we're not gonna use the, the features of our ELN for doing chemical inventory, only for sample management, for example, if you can do that. Um, now, if you go to even larger organizations or larger groups or, or organizations um, that have, established processes that, you know, let's say they've been around for a while and they, they have things that people have been using for ages. Um, it's very uh, heavily embedded in their process. There's a lot of data in there um, and people would be very resistant to change. Um, then this is the most challenging of all situations for sure. Uh, this is what a lot of commercial organizations face. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've seen it with colleagues of mine, for example, who work in those domains. And um, yeah, uh, to solve that is very challenging. You might, you might need to try to re-architecture things um, and have, let's say, sort of like a data lake um, to, to sort of merge data, or you have to disable some features of your ELN um, and so on. So uh, types of uh, organizations that would face these. So you could think of a university might have, you know, a few thousand uh, students uh, involved in research. And there are a few who, who have sort of picked one ELN that they offer. So for example, uh, TU Graz uh, is using ELAB FTW and offer it to over, over a thousand uh, people. Uh, you could be a, a research institution like a Max Planck or Fraunhofer. Um, and uh, Maybe you have a few hundred people, and you want this ELN slash limb system to be to be used among uh, those people. Uh, there, I mean, there are a lot of diverse use cases to satisfy. Um, so that's certainly a challenge. Uh, if you go to a department, then you start narrowing in your scope a little bit. Um, the domain becomes more specialized. Also, the number of people is fewer. Um, so you might consider just uh, launching an ELN or making a choice for just your department. And then of course, there's the individual laboratory. And this one is probably the, the easiest to implement because it uh, affects the fewest number of people. It's the most uh, focused in terms of, of uh, domain and scope. Um, yeah, and often there's not a lot of uh, legacy systems that you need to integrate with. Yeah, you know, other things that need to be considered are, are budget. Um, do you have a budget for this? Uh, yeah, and on the long term. So if you're going to go with a third party service, uh, you have to think like you're going to be paying a subscription fee every single year. Um, it's not bad. I mean, we pay fees, we pay, we pay our, our, our electricity bills every year. So um, these things can be done. Um, one, one important consideration is, is long term support. So if you want to use this thing for a long time, do you have faith that, that this solution and this doesn't matter whether it's open source or closed source or commercial is long-term support. Is this solution gonna exist on the long-term? And the short answer is nothing lasts forever. So all of these software solutions have a lifetime. And uh, I think uh, as uh, John pointed out in the previous talk, one of the most important things of an ELN is interoperability. So meaning, um, Plan, plan for whatever you use, it will one day not be used anymore and plan for that. And if you want the data out of there, then you're, you have to have some way of, of getting it out. So you have to, there has to be some kind of interoperability with these serialized formats that you can, you can extract all the resources that you have tied up in that solution and put them somewhere else. Um, yeah, another, another uh, consideration is, is number of users. Is this for just a small number of users? or large number of users, uh, will the solution be 
performant and are you able to satisfy all of these diverse needs? Uh, and then of course, uh, if there are existing systems in place. And I think, I hope I've sort of given you the impression here that um, why it's so difficult for uh, research organizations to, to adopt an ELN. Uh, there is really um, a lot to, to consider when, when making the leap. Um, so yeah, uh, in our work at our organization, after doing assessments of, of the various ELNs, so we focus mainly on, on chemistry. Um, we came up with sort of these requirements, high level requirements. One is that the ELN should have experimental notes. Um, it should have inventory features. So we do want inventory integrated into the ELN and not as a separate solution. Um, we do uh, require some domain specific features, things like in our case, chemical drawing tools. Um, but I've seen other cases for biology, for example, there might be some like DNA drawing tools or yeah, well plate, for example, uh, type of uh, modules. So some, some kind of domain specific features are important. Uh, it has to be very easily searchable. It has to be, um, be capable of uh, having collaboration between researchers that people can work collaboratively on experimental notes together. Uh, it should be accessible from essentially anywhere. Uh, this means generally web-based or yeah, uh, needing network access. Um, uh, it should have uh, very good data security and be compliant with um, all uh, security measures like uh, ISO standard, for example, as well as GDPR compliant. Um, data ownership, um, so regardless of whether it's it's a third party solution or like whether it's a commercial solution or a free solution, uh, the ownership of the data needs to reside with the our organization. So we, we are the owners or our organization is the owner of the data that it generates. And they sh it should always have access to it and be able to do backups of it at any time. Again, uh, extensibility and interoperability as John pointed out is extremely important, uh, not only to uh, get your data out, but also to be able to integrate it with existing solutions to, to find ways such that uh, uh, we can synchronize uh, data stores. Um, support is also important because we intend to onboard a substantial number of people and get them using it. And so, yeah, um, support is good. Uh, and lastly, a company profile. So basically, we while we accept that the solution won't last forever. Five years would be good. If it can survive the next five years, that would be that would be already uh, a good start. Um, but we see the ELN as a tool to collect and manage our data. And uh, we have to sort of prepare ourselves for, for the time where that particular ELN will not be used anymore, yet our data stores will stay persistent. Yeah, so... Um, I think in a nutshell though, uh, whatever the choice of an ELN, uh, there should be a goal of, of making sure it's, it's part of your data governance plan. And a little bit about a data governance plan, like the goals of the data governance plan would be to remove information silos, uh, to sort of retain the knowledge of the research, to make the research more accessible, um, in principle to enable meta research, so to, to sort of uh, dig deeper into the data that we have and, and find new things and to sort of improve sustainability. And by that, I mean uh, retention of knowledge that uh, people aren't redoing experiments that someone else already did and so on. Um, and some of the, the concepts of, of data governance that are important to consider are uh, data lineage. So that's, for example, knowing where does the data come from and how has it been transformed? Uh, data security. So does the data meet regulatory requirements for compliance and auditability? And then data availability, we need to know where is it located and how can we access it? And uh, if we have these things, then, then we have sort of uh, complete traceability of our data. And uh, this makes it so that we can um, uh, access it and, and reuse it. Well, okay. I mean, there's, there's additional metadata required as well that could be thrown in here, but on a high level, these are sort of the key ones. Um, yeah, so 
yeah, as mentioned, metadata management is very key to the successful data governance strategy. Um, and just let's go a little bit into what we're talking about here with metadata. So you can think of data as just like the raw files and then metadata is data about data. So this metadata would be data about these files and you can sub group metadata into technical metadata, such as the database name, table type, data type, uh, functional uh, metadata, such as uh, denomination and classification and tags and things like that. Um, operational data, such as uh, who can access it, who made it, uh, uh, what and when happened, where did it happen? Uh, and then uh, data lineage. So if this data was the output of or, or originated from some other data set, like as a result of a transformation. And then of course, uh, your sort of taxonomy. So where in your uh, data stores, how, how this is all laid out and how you can navigate to this data set again in the future. Um, so if you can sort of combine all these things together, then you can have a pretty solid foundation for your data governance in terms of uh, compliance and security standards and availability. Um, so a little bit more uh, about metadata. So again, metadata is data about data. So metadata could describe a single piece of data or it could describe a data set or a collection. And there are standard types of, of metadata. So there are things like the descriptive metadata. So in this example here, so just some Excel sheet, the descriptive data would be like the, the column names here. So um, this data set, being all the data inside this table. Um, it has four books and it's created by uh, John Doe and it has the column titles, title, author, year, cover, edition, price, and ID, for example. Yeah, uh, structural metadata um, would, be, would be information about uh, the way the data elements are, are organized uh, and the relationships and structures. So, so for example, uh, a database schema or an entity relationship model um, so you can describe this table and its relationship to other tables in the structural metadata. And then there's also administrative metadata. So um, this would be like uh, information, like bibliographic type of stuff, like uh, information about the origins of the data, uh, their type and access rights as well. So when it was created and uh, where this data came from. Yeah. So. Uh, these are common types of metadata that are kind of uh, typically uh, people want to store uh, in, in order to ensure that all their data assets have a, a uh, uh, comply with a good data governance strategy. Yeah. Um, and I think another important distinction to make is, and I'm sure you've probably heard this before, distinction between structured and unstructured data. So structured data would be things that have a very well-defined pattern, very well-defined structure, like a relational database. Um, usually you can think of them as, as data in tabular form with relationships between tables. Um, on the complete opposite end, you have unstructured data uh, where you know, the data file, you, 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 the, you don't really know what's in it. Um, so it could be structured in, in any way you like. This could be videos or PDFs or you know, Word documents or photographs. Uh, they're not sort of out of the box machine actionable unless you've harvested some information out of them some way. And then there's semi-structured and this is like things like uh, there's some kind of structure to them, but they're quite flexible. So this would be things like JSON and XML. So it's like a, a, a syntax or language for, for um, uh, describing things in a machine readable way. Um, but you can't always rely on the structure of it. So why probably they're called semi-structured. Yeah, so um, I think when, it, when thinking about an organization or I mean, whether it be a research group or a large organization, it's good to have a data governance strategy. Um, this, is, this is one that uh, was put together uh, by a consulting company, uh, basically reflecting how a lot of commercial organizations do their, their data governance uh, nowadays. Um, so they pretty much look at that they have a whole bunch of data sources, many different heterogeneous data sources, um, databases, sensors, documents, whatever. 
similar like research, uh, we do have a lot of different data sources uh, from our instruments and our laboratory notebooks and our inventory management systems and so on. And uh, they basically just dump all this into a data lake, but ensuring that there is uh, sufficient metadata ingested at the same time, such that they can figure out what to do with the data again later. Once it's in there, then they, they do their, their analysis and so on. And, uh, and then they, they can access the data and, and use uh, data analysis programs and so on uh, later on. So I think the point here is uh, maybe for a large organization, it makes sense to, to uh, have such an infrastructure um, sort of centralized. Uh, however, if you're not a large, a large organization, if you're just a one group or maybe a small department uh, and you can't really uh, afford or put all this together, um, then just having an ELN uh, do it all for you uh, might make sense where you can sort of uh, treat it as your data lake and uh, data warehouse and everything at the same time. Um, yeah, uh, so I think that pretty much covers everything. So I just want to emphasize uh, some takeaway messages. So one that the ELN market is very diverse. Um, there are several business models to choose from. Um, the choice depends on many constraints, uh, not just on the offerings of the ELN, but also on your own situation, your uh, organization's situation. Um, it is very important that you uh, ensure for, for longevity and sustainability that you ensure that your ELN or LIM system of choice does fit into a sound data management plan. Um, and you should spend a significant amount of time upfront when making the choice, figuring out how it will integrate with other elements uh, in, your, in your organization's uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to request everyone um, is if possible, please fill out this uh, survey. I'll post the link in the chat. This is a, just a general purpose survey about uh, data management, research data management. Um, and uh, it would be very helpful for us to, to sort of understand where, where people's needs are uh, in terms of uh, research data management. So once again, I'll, I'll post that in the, in the chat in a moment. And aside from that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. Thank you for the very nice presentation, uh, Mark. And actually, thank you for this review, which is really checking actually what is possible. And it's also highlighting that uh, it's not enough just to see what is possible, but we also have to organize our thoughts and uh, we really have to see actually uh, what we have in our backpack and then we can decide in which direction we would like to go to. Uh, and. Uh, before going to the questions, uh, I would like to ask all of you uh, to not just to fill this form. So please fill this form, it's important. Uh, Mark has already put the link into the chat, but also go to your name in Zoom and rename yourself uh, by adding your affiliation in it. So we can also see actually who is attending uh, these tutorials. We would like to really communicate and uh, also we would like to turn it a bit uh, into a discussion, but for this we, we have to know actually uh, with whom we are speaking about. Uh, and uh, especially those who would like to have questions, uh, please uh, put your affiliation also into a bracket next to your name. Uh, let's start uh, with the questions uh, with John. So hello, uh, Mark, great talk. I can see what you meant about the resonance between uh, the two talks. Uh, my question is about APIs and you've certainly surveyed a large number of uh, ELN systems. And my sense is that interoperability of an ELN within an institution's existing infrastructure might be more of, it's a component that works together with other components. How many of these, especially mid and uh, low level ELNs have APIs. Is that a common thing or not many of them have APIs yet? Yeah, it's, it's very common. Almost all of the ones, almost all of the popular ones have uh, very well documented APIs as well as even like uh, Python libraries for interacting with them. Um, the one thing that where they differentiate themselves is uh, how extensive their APIs are. 
So some of them, um, they say, oh, we only think our users are going to want to be able to do this and this and this. So we're only going to make API endpoints for like these few entities. Uh, whereas one of them actually, uh, LabStep, uh, they don't make that differentiation. So the user has full access to all of the APIs that they use to speak between their front end and their back end. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, but in, in, in principle, yeah, all of them, almost all of the, the modern popular ones uh, have, have good uh, REST APIs and good documentation. Thank you. Next one is uh, Marco Scheidian. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, hi, Mark. Thanks for the, for the great overview. And uh, I guess you've seen a lot of these things lately. Um, <laughs> We emphasize a lot on, on, on the importance of structured metadata and, 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 and all these kind of things. And in an essence, or in, in some sense, no checking is kind of the opposite, right? You, you're providing people with a tool that allow them to put unstructured information just in, into these rich text fields. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think? What, what is the, what, what is the, the, the general um, um, theme with all, these, uh, with all these ELNs? Are they aware about like deep rich metadata, not just authors, right, and who did what when, but but really going into deep what, what you want to describe about your experiments, like pressures, temperatures, and, and all the all workflow steps, all these kind of things. Yeah, so uh, I would say, so first of all, I totally agree with you that uh, the, the unstructures is not exactly what we want. But I, at the same time, I, I see that we face the challenge, like John was describing before, that there's, you know, so many different ways to describe this. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to have all the flexibility that the user would ever want and still have a good UI UX. But anyway, uh, what I have seen from a few of them, so I would say, I think maybe uh, eLab Journal and LabStep, they try to do this where um, you can really, like it's, it's quite well structured in the steps that you're taking. Uh, that you can define like unit quantities and, and say like, I took this thing and I heated it at this temperature, here are the units, et cetera. Uh, the problem is that even with that, they don't, it's not flexible enough, right? So that they still have to leave space for free text. And so what people end up doing is not using that functionality and they just use the free text because they're either unaware it exists or it maybe takes too long for them to click those buttons. I'm not sure, but I, we've seen this with the testing that a lot of people just they don't they don't do it. Yeah, so maybe this is an, an issue of just training and and just making people aware, and maybe it's an issue of having good habits. But uh, uh, maybe it's just an issue of like yeah, I think it's also awareness. Like I, I accept that some things I can write down in a structured form, but some things there's no place for me to do that or it's not there's no yeah i think it's a question of usefulness right if your data analysis actually makes makes use of these structured information then you are much more inclined to actually use it yeah, yeah that's true that's incentive enough right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay thank you thank you yeah. Uh, the next question is coming from uh Pepper marcus Mm, uh, hello, uh, Mark. Thank you very much. It was very, very nice review of all the ELN and tools. Uh, my question was uh, regarding the uh, data security and compliance uh, point that you mentioned that it was uh, very important for decision making. Um, so, can you comment on all the tools that you have surveyed if they are like really good examples of data security and compliance and maybe not so good examples from other tools? Um, I can say about the ones that did have good compliance that one, anything, yeah, so, so the, the only time we had issues with uh, security and compliance was when we were looking at open source and all the responsibility was on us. Uh, then we had to ensure our own security and compliance. Um, on any commercial ones, uh, especially, so especially if they're operating in Europe, um, and uh, so a lot of them offer cloud-based solutions because that makes, it's the easiest for the vendor to be able to, to provide them in a scalable way, right? Uh, so they, they provide cloud-based and of course with cloud-based, then a lot of question marks pop up about, hey, who, where's my data? I don't have my data, you have it. And uh, who owns it? Uh, you know, what if AWS gets hacked or things like this, right? Uh, so. I think a lot of those questions have been answered over the past like five years. Like they've really taken the 
data ownership and data security very seriously, such that uh, with any of the vendors that we spoke with about this, when, when discussing whether we wanted on cloud or on premise, um, they, they all did, I mean, they all were compliant with GDPR, they were all compliant with, uh, so I can't remember what the, the ISO standard is, but, but they have regular penetration te uh, tests done on, on their servers. And this is all kind of standard and nowadays because, uh, because everyone's trying to push towards, towards having infrastructure in the cloud and uh, in, in order for, to uh, appeal to any customers, any serious customers storing banking data and whatever, then uh, AWS and the, and the, the uh, software vendors who operate using AWS, they need to comply with those. And so, yeah, from, from our research, they, they do, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> a similar question about uh, data security and privacy uh, from uh, Andreas uh, Punica in the chat. So the question was uh, uh, about uh, data protection and privacy. I know many people, for example, staff councils uh, who are critical of systems are recording uh, the combination of who and when did what. So what it would be your comment on this, Mark, uh, when we record this, that goes somewhat uh, related to the GDPR kind of stuff. Well, so this is definitely a, a very interesting topic we, that we've uh, talked about a fair bit. So, um, okay, so th there, any ones that are operated in Europe are GDPR compliant. And if you want to, you can opt in for uh, things like analytic services. So for example, um, the ELN, providers uh, to try to find out where people are having problems with their software. Um, they do, uh, they have like these event logs of like where clicks were made and so on. And they can anonymize the data and then send them to uh, a service from Google Analytics to try to, to try to see, you know, try to basically mine their data. Uh, they do anonymize it, right? So in principle, uh, IP addresses and names and all that stuff is, is gone. Uh, but nonetheless, this was a, a topic for us for um, data privacy and uh, you can opt out of that. And so that's what we would do. For example, we would, we would just, uh, just keep everyone on our, our side happy. We would opt out of, of having the company use that service. That's the one thing. The other thing is, and this is a little bit of a contradiction in what it means to be GD, uh, uh, GLP compliant, yeah, to have an audit trail of the work that was done and worker privacy, yeah. So we have like the Betriebsrat or the, the staff council, which, which has stipulations that you're not allowed to use technologies to monitor people's work, yeah. Uh, so for example, you couldn't put like a camera in the, in the laboratory and then look in and check, make sure all the people are working. Yeah, so there are laws to protect against that. Um, however, an ELN for traceability and auditability needs to keep a log of who did what when. Yeah, if, if you didn't do that, uh, I mean, you couldn't file patents if you made a discovery, right? Uh, I mean, that, that information is necessary. So um, our workers council basically said, um, the thing that's restricted from the, the law, from the staff council is not that we log all this information, but that we shouldn't be providing dashboards to management that gives them easy accessibility to monitor the uh, work of their employees, right? And, and no one really does that, right? So as long as this is running in the background and not really kind of easily accessible to any uh, controlling body, but uh, is still there as a record in case it, it needs to be used, uh, it is compliant, at least from our staff council's uh, point of view. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there was a, uh, another comment uh, from uh, Justine uh, reporting uh, about uh, yet another uh, place where ELNs are uh, brought together uh, and there is an ELN guide uh, provided by ZBMED. Justine, do you want to add something? Um, yes, I can just add that maybe this uh, guide is meant for life science researchers, so I don't know if this fits this audience here, but maybe Someone is also from the life sciences here, so I thought might help. 
Thank you. Does that mean that there are lots of uh, domain specific features in those uh, ELNs that you have reviewed? Well, actually not really, because we are also considering ELNs such as RSpace and ELAB SCW. So, and there are interviews from uh, institutions that have implemented these ELNs. And so you can maybe um, build on their experience with these tools. Thank you very much. And actually, I, I think this is really good that uh, from the different communities, from the different NFDI consortia, we can really learn from one another and we can help one another. And this is exactly the reason why we also run this tutorial series. Uh, you are all very welcome from the different communities to come and share. Thank you very much.